Hello, everyone, and welcome to Beyond Alpha. My name is Labib Mahfouz, America's Head of Channel Alliances and Strategic Partnerships at Infusion. And today we are talking about alternative data. Um, guests today are Vineet Kapoor, co-founder and COO of Alpha Rock, and Daniel Sandberg, who is the Managing Director and Head of Quantumental Research at S&P. Thank you very much, both of you, for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Maybe we could uh, start with some intros. Dan, we could start with you. Yeah. Thanks very much for having me, Labib. Um, so Dan Sandberg, Head of Quantum Mental Research for S&P Global. At S&P Global, the Quantum Mental Research team uses the S&P Global data as well as uh, data from third-party partners to create workflows and data products that help clients make data-informed decisions. Thanks, Dan. Vineet Kapoor. Um, I am the co-founder and COO of Alpha Rock. We are a company that sits on the intersection of uh, AI and finance. Um, our mission is to revolutionize market research by using the latest computational techniques and empowering our users to make better economic decisions. Well, this should uh, this should be a pretty interesting conversation. Let's just let's go with some uh, some background here. Investment managers, the the investment management industry has has been hungry for data for for decades. You know, we have you know the macro managers are always looking at macro data and country data, uh, stock pickers, long short equity. They're always you know pulling in corporate data. Um, across across the spectrum, and and S and P specifically has a long history of of getting data, right? As whether it was from the rating agency side or otherwise, it's it's constantly pulling in data for for consumption. It, it seems that over the last decade or so, that hunger for data has just hasn't been quenched. Can can you talk a little bit about? Uh, what you're doing specifically, what S and P is doing generally on, you know, pulling in data overall, and then we'll we'll dig a little deeper on the alternative data side. Sure thing. We do have a long history, so I, I like to to kick off with a fun fact here uh, that that dovetails nicely with that. A few people know this: Henry Varnum Poor, who is the namesake in Standard and Poor is the P. He was a a data guru. He was actually very well known for his supply chain data on the railways and canals. He, he published his first edition of that compiled supply chain data in 1860. So, you know, quite, <laughs> quite, quite, a, quite a long history there. Um, and then he updated that data uh, annually. So, um, so, and probably, you know, uh, uh, delivered it by horseback or something, right? Well, yeah, um, I, I did say that S&P had a long history. So I, I guess I, I generally didn't know it was that long. Yeah, uh, you got it right, right on the head there. <laughs> so long history. Um, the last 10 years have been an interesting 10 years for sure. I'd say, I think the last 10 years, a lot of businesses realized the digitization of everything means that there's a way to, to track almost all activity. So for instance, getting here today, I took the Long Island Railroad. I, I purchased my ticket through the app, connected to my credit card, right? I'm sitting in the studio today with my cell phone in my pocket that's, you know, transmitting my... Uh, my Hopefully my, it's on uh, mute. It's, on, yeah. it's, on, it's actually on a, it's, it's an airplane mode. It's on airplane mode for now. So I guess, I guess I'm off the radar. But, um, you know, suffice it to say, I, I think that a lot of companies sat up and recognized that they have this data exhaust that they can monetize. And so there's been um, really a, you know, almost a, a glut of data out there just from, from all of this new unstructured content coming to market and suddenly being um, accessible to whoever could, could think of the, you know, most creative way to use it. But at the same time, it's become a fire hose that you just can't drink from. And so what we've tried to do at S&P is, is solve that problem for our clients by standardizing the content, by making it machine readable when possible, by linking it to common identifiers. And we've basically created a factory floor to take that raw content and clean it up and make it usable to uh, derive insights. When, um, you know, our focus today is alternative data. So... When I when I'm thinking of alternative data, you know my my viewpoint is is pretty limited. I think of and it's just based on things that I've read. It's um, it's uh, the amount of you know parking spaces available in malls uh, or you know airplane you know private jet tail numbers 
what else are people looking at? The term alternative data, I mean, at the end of the day, it's really just data. And I, what's I, alternative to one person and standard for the other person? It's the the name is is a very ambiguous definition. So I'll give you a concrete example. If you polled enough people, I think most would agree that the regulatory filings, the 10Ks and 10Qs, where companies um, release their financials, is traditional data. Mm -hmm. But we are seeing um, clients using that traditional data alongside some of the less common uh, aspects of those filings. For example, in the footnotes, there are often um, gems of information that will put into context those financials. Maybe revenue beat consensus estimates with a Wall Street expectation substantially, but was that revenue beat owed to a one-off windfall or was it a new contract that's going to produce that sort of same performance for the next 10 years? That may be somewhere in a footnote and being able to collect that textual data and standardize it and identify that it, that it has meaning and value, that is, in, in a lot of senses, it's an, an alternative use of that regulatory filing. And I think a lot of, a lot of uh, market participants would consider that alternative data. And so while before you may have had an analyst sit there and read all the footnotes and go through it, now because of the digitization of, of the filings, you're able to, to, you know, machines could read that. So this this increase in in data and the digitization of data has been ha, has been pretty pivotal for for Alpha Rock. Absolutely. And and your role for your firm in this in this whole you know, hunger for data is all right. You got all this stuff. What are you going to do with it? And what signals does it actually produce? Exactly. And I, I want to go back to what you said uh, earlier, Labib. If you think about the adoption of data, the life cycle, you're correct that the macro guys and the quant guys were the first guys to be able to do this. What the world is now realizing, especially the fundamental equity guys are realizing, is that they are at a significant information disadvantage because they have not invested in building data science teams capabilities within their firms. And they are- For, for equity, for equity for, specifically. Not or just corporate. equity, everything, everything. Um, and they are tr playing catch up now from a disadvantaged place where they don't have those capabilities and they're trying to get in. So there's a growing realization across the industry, especially the fundamental guys, credit guys, you know, uh, Dan made a very good point about reading 10Ks and Qs. Loan documents, they're so long and extensive. If you could have a machine summarize them for you very quickly, wouldn't that save uh, a portfolio manager you know, hours of work and time to focus on generating alpha as opposed to being uh, reading these documents? So everywhere across the industry, we see a seismic change, shift in terms of focus and unfortunately, because of the way uh, the portfolio managers have grown through the system, focused on generating alpha, focused on understanding the markets, they have not invested as much time understanding how data works. So now what we are asking them to do is to suddenly become data scientists. And that's where Alpha Rock comes in to basically help people outsource that function over to us. And we help these people get insights at scale, customized insights at scale. So... A client would say, I have all this data, or I have all these filings, or I have all these loan docs. Help me make heads and tails of this? Or or is it more of, I trade in this manner, what kind of data should I be pulling in? Do you recommend? And what are you able to to articulate in a clearer way and, and so that my, my team can make investment decisions? It's uh, all that and a lot more. Mm. So what we are doing is basically, one of our products is called Turing, Professor Alan Turing and the test for artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. What we are trying to do is give people a machine that they can talk to just as humans, such that they don't have to worry about the data. What they should be concerned about is the accuracy of the insights that are coming out and leave the rest to us. Now, if there's some very specific data that they own, and a lot of our clients do have some very specific data that they do own, we are happy to bring that in and add that to their ensemble of insights. But outside of that, let's talk to the machine and let the machine give you the data, and it's our job to go find the most unique and differentiated data sets, cultivate those, clean those, and 
complete those because no data set, as Dan would agree, is complete in itself. You have to supplement it with other things to make it meaningful and improve the resolution of that data. And for S&P, with, with all the data that you have, and I'm sure you're also incorporating machine learning to pull in even more information, um, or at least articulate that information, what are you seeing that clients are specifically asking for? We've, um, we've developed in a couple of areas specifically. Supply chain continues to be an area where uh, clients can continue to uh, find value. Um, back to your roots. Back to our roots. Any, <laughs> any, I think content that really informs on the movement of money, people, things, uh, that's, that's interesting. That's, that's um, value additive. Textual data is another dimension that where we've um, found a, a bunch of um, really um, compelling content um, and insights, and we've spent uh, quite a bit of, of um, the bandwidth on the quantum mental research team developing natural language processing algorithms that can help with parsing that textual data and uh, extracting the features that matter most. What are clients looking on your end? Well, they're they're coming to us for a host of things. So we think of our product suite in three pieces. So we have one product called Occam that focuses on helping clients understand intent. What is on the mind of the consumer? What's in the mind of the economy? Which way it's going? Our second product, which I mentioned earlier, Turing, is focused on the nowcast. So we use a whole different data sets, a set of data sets uh, focused on nowcasting a business. And people are coming to us asking for insights there. And then our third product, Ampere, is focused on helping people understand what is in the market already, what's priced into the on, into the stock's price today. So we, we give people all three and we have demand for all three, uh, very strong demand for all three of those products. So I have a question, and uh, without you know revealing any secret sauce, sure. what is priced in the stock today? Right. So how, with any sort of uh, confidence, are you able to say, all right, this information is priced in, and this information may not be? Well, if you take a step back, that's what the quants have been doing and doing very successfully for a very long period of time. Mm-hmm. And finally, we are making the same tools and the same analytical, applying the same analytical rigor to those data sets to help fundamental managers understand with a reasonable degree of probability what is priced in. Is there some unusual trading taking place in the stock? I mean, if you go back and look at it traditionally, when I spent my career at Morgan Stanley, people would call the trading desk, say, hey, the stock is moving, what's going on? Then they'll hang up with the Morgan Stanley analyst, they'll call the Goldman guy and call the city guy. But today, if I can make that information available to you on your desktop, in terms of what is happening, what we think is unusual, is there unusual retail buying in this stock? Is there some unusual uh, corporate activity going on, you know, buybacks or what have you? Is there a big whale in this stock? Wouldn't that be useful? And so, it's all statistical. So taking just general market data, general uh, statistics and data that you have, and then and then looking at trade activity and trade volume, who's buying, who's selling, and then making sense of the two put together, marrying the two together. Marrying the two and improving the resolution. Because if you think about it from a quant perspective, if they're right 51%, they'll make that bet all day long. Mm-hmm. A fundamental manager probably doesn't want to be able, want to make a bet at 51% because then he'll get whipsawed. He wants a much higher degree of probability. So you have to change the math. But it's not unsurmountable, and the insights that you'll get from that are very big for a fundamental manager. Should I sell now, or is it worth holding on? Is there is there more that I is it, you know is there a risk of me leaving P and L on the table? Exactly. Un- understood. Understood. S and P has is gigantic, obviously, and you have data scientists and you have uh, a number of uh, of personnel that kind of take this information and produce reports and graphics and analytics, et cetera, et cetera. Is there an area where perhaps outsourcing? Some of the, the where where an investment manager says, let me let me pull in data from this provider, but maybe outsource other aspects of 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 the work that I need to do. Sometimes the larger firms hire their own yep. data scientists to to make heads and tails of the information. Sometimes they you know can go through other providers. What are you seeing? What are you seeing people doing? 
Um, so you might be asking a couple of uh, different questions here. I, I'd say, you know, one one answer could be that uh, we are increasingly seeing people working alongside machines. That that with the emergence of some of the uh, latest developments in AI, in, in particular, uh, we're starting to think about a, a machine as a co-pilot more than just a tool, and that's that's very novel in in, in a lot of uh, ways. Um, the other uh, aspects to our approach is that we try to deliver the solutions that clients want without forcing them to necessarily take it in, in any particular format. So if you are uh, interested in insights that uh, don't require data science um, and, and you're looking to get that information in a more user-friendly way, we have a desktop platform to deliver it in that fashion. We have tools for the quant light audience that may not necessarily be developers, but they have some coding skills, or maybe they have the numeric uh, methods, uh, but not necessarily the coding. And so we have um, a platform we call Clarify that delivers to that audience in particular. And then, of course, we uh, have tools available for the more serious quants. We have a partnership with Databricks where we um, have created a workbench. They can seamlessly access our content and leverage Databricks for uh, 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 version control and compute. Uh, we have a partnership with Snowflake for cloud delivery. Then, of course, we have access to the content through APIs and on-prem deployable databases. So you're working off the whole the whole suite. We're agnostic. Whatever, whatever yes. you need, we, we, we could help and even... even Partnering with more specialized firms to, to to give your clients what they're looking for, and we, you know, one of the other ways that we do that is by tagging all of our content to our internal identifier. But then we have a cross-reference service so that if you're looking to marry it together with content that sits outside of the S and P ecosystem, there is an, an easy way to do that. You know, you bring an interesting point: identifiers. We're so used to, you know, understanding tickers that, that everyone, it's all standardized, but it's not, is it, Vineet? And, it's not. And some people do a better job than others in pulling in a quote-unquote identifier from multiple sources, um, not just your, you know, your traditional, you know, corporate reports or equity analyst reports, but from all kinds of where sources where even the the individuals supplying that data aren't even using the right terminology. They're not even using the right tickers. Can you talk a little bit about, about how, how a data scientist is able to, to extract that kind of information? That's a very important point because if you, have, if you would like to construct a proper ensemble, marry all these disparate data sets together, you need to have that. You absolutely need to have that. And there's a lot of brain damage that gets done. We have a lot of resources dedicated internally to doing this and doing this right. So unfortunately, there are some off-the-shelf uh, sol solutions available, but there's some amount of work that no matter what you have to do to bring it all together, which is why there's such a big gap when, when uh, you get to use the data. You go out, you buy a data set, and then you say, oh, God, I have to now set up uh, my own security master, which... Uh, it's, it's a big, I mean, you guys have done a lot of work in, at Infusion about uh, making this easy for people as well. No, I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely a challenge. But I'm also thinking clients use it for different reasons. And so, yes, maybe we could, we could paint a, a broad, use a broad paintbrush and say, for the most part, clients are looking for X, Y, and Z, and so we'll produce that. But then it, there's a customization element to, to this that, that I think becomes quite challenging. Yes. And so... Do firms need to inevitably, are we going to see a point where firms are saying, I need to hire my own data scientist or data science team? It depends on your budget. Hmm. It depends on you have the right mindset to do it. We talk to a lot of people, a lot of firms who don't have the right mindset. They will never be able to hire and retain and grow data science talent. It's a different breed altogether. Mm. The technology folks are very different from the financial Wall Street types. So will there be some people who will be successful at doing it? Yes. But there'll be a lot of people who will just say, why do I have to do this? You don't do you know, uh, everything in, in Wall Street today in-house. There are specialists who do that. We want to be that specialist where we are making machines that help people make better decisions. 
and they're open source, so anybody can come and you know be a client and and leverage those uh, insights. So, in our prior discussions, we have talked about how how there's a lot of crowdsourcing data that gets get, yeah. that gets pulled in, yes. and so the data becomes more and more reliable as more and more. Pr- people are providing information. Absolutely. Can you, can you just you know educate us a little bit on, on what what that scale means exactly? Sure. So for example, our first product, um, Occam, which is, if you think about, take a step back, think about survey. Survey is one of the oldest forms of the market research. Right. But it's been done very poorly. There's a great book written um, uh, called Everybody Lies, which talks about what people tell you is very different than what people type into Google. So what we have done there is used latest machine learning and data science techniques to basically filter out the fraudsters and improve the accuracy with which we are gathering this data. Now, for example, today we are taking in about 250,000 data points every day. It's growing to be about 400,000 by the end of this month. Mm -hmm. And all these data points are being taken in based on questions that our clients are asking. So the machine is every day becoming smarter and smarter. And we are using the data that we bring in, including the personas of the people who are answering those questions, to create these personas. So the next step for us is to be able to give you a predicted answer even before it has gone out to the survey world. We can give you a predicted answer today on how people are likely to react to your question, which is, a, if you think about a very powerful a uh, place to be, if you're Pepsi and you're doing your new uh, drink survey, before you even do the survey, you come to us and we can give you a predicted answer on what kinds of personas are likely to buy this. Or, you know, if, if Harley is looking to join, uh, build an electric motorbike, who is likely to buy an electric bike? It's not going to be a who traditional. Who is likely to buy an electric bike? Exactly. It's not going to be a traditional, <laughs> tra- traditional uh, Harley buyer, right? It'll be somebody different. So how do you target those? I can't wait to see what that person looks like. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we can have an <laughs> offline conversation about that. We have the data. When S&P looks at this, or when you're looking at this even in, in, in the development of your own career, p- people need to adapt and adopt new skill sets. Sure. What are the, you know, people will say he's brought, you know, data scientists. Like, what is that? Can, can we can we just go back a little bit to basics and go, you know, what is somebody w- supposed to major in or look at? Or, or how do you hire a, a data scientist? For I, me personally, when I think of a data scientist, I think of someone like uh, an insurance actuary. Like, th- that's that's where my head goes initially. But I think it's a lot bigger than that, a lot more than that. I, th- I think you're right. I, I personally studied chemistry in undergrad, and then I did my PhD in physics, and I landed in finance. So, you know, I, I think that a lot of the skills that we apply to data and uh, extracting the insights from data and building the analytics and the frameworks that help us test our, our questions and our hypotheses, those are transferable skills and what we're seeing with the emergence of data science is really a focus more on the process than the subject matter expertise. It doesn't matter if you know the nuances of a chemical system or a financial system or a traffic pattern. You can apply the same tools, the same AI and machine learning, um, and in, in some cases, the same data to answer the questions. So you don't need product knowledge necessarily. Didn't say that. that. I okay. didn't say that. I'd say uh, that if we think of um, the importance of the different skills, the problem solving skill is, in my opinion, the most important. Filling in the details of the system you know, can then, can then be a, a sort of minor skill for the data scientist. And that data scientist should be working with someone who, who has, has, the, who has the, the flip, the subject matter expertise and the industry knowledge is their first and primary skill. And maybe they, they know a little bit about data science and, the, and that's how the two personas work together. That makes a lot of sense. So we, we focused on using, using data for an investment decision, but there, there's got to be uses outside of just uh, you know, the, the portfolio managers and the analysts in, in a firm. You have middle office, you have operations, you have compliance, you have, you know, the finance teams. What are some of the, do you see uses to, to those groups? 
as well, not just the operating groups, not just the investment side. So, and, and I would even add corporates, you know, so there, there are always uh, use cases from advertising to looking for an adjacency to understanding what your competitors might be doing or who they're talking to or where they're developing next. All of that, there's a data signature or data trail that can be used to extract that information. To your question, uh, which I, I think you were asking, what is what is what are some of the uses besides the portfolio management um, mm-hmm. aspect of it outside of of the alpha? Uh, you know, risk is is a big one, right? So understanding um, the connection between companies and between securities and how a failure in one part of the system might propagate through that system, um, you know, that's that's probably top of mind. I, I could not agree with you more. Um, financials for us, financial industry, Wall Street industry, is uh, important, but a small part of our overall business. A few years ago, uh, my partner, uh, business partner, Michael, uh, did a podcast uh, called Tim Cook's Dashboard. If you take a step back, what we are trying to replicate is what McKinsey came out with many years ago and created the CEO Dashboard. How about we take all your internal data, put it in our dashboard as you as a CEO can make better decisions. But today with alternative data and all the other things that we are collecting, we can make a dashboard of all your competitors. So if you're the CEO of Target, don't you want to see a dashboard of what your competitor, your peer at uh, Walmart is seeing, what your peer at Amazon is seeing, what your peer at uh, Costco is seeing? So we can now create all that. We can tell you who's getting into your moat and who are you competing truly against. So with all these tools available, it behooves you if you are not getting in and asking these right questions and utilizing these tools that are available today at a a very easy to use. You don't need to become a data scientist. These are natural language tools, natural language queries um, and dashboards that have already been built. That's fascinating. And even... On the investment side, being able to look at multiple companies, literally look at all those dashboards at the same exactly. time yeah. and to seeing how your portfolio can change on the back of that. There are two, two things that we talked about here. We, we talked about machine learning and artificial intelligence. And, and those two phrases go hand in hand, but they're, they're very different. Um, and I want, I want to pull on this a little bit, Vinita, if that's okay. Sure. Documents, hundreds of pages, um, Loan docs, for example, credit facility documents. Machine learning can take those docs and pull in information and articulate that information in a nice little spreadsheet. Of uh, so you could compare coupons, you could compare debenture, you could compare compare sure. all those things. Absolutely. Where does AI come in? It helps you make better decisions, make great gain insights from that data. You can collect all this data. That's why actually a lot of people come to us initially when they look at what we have built, they'll say, oh, this is ChatGPT. No, it's not. Because ChatGPT doesn't have the data. The first thing is to get the data. Then you can make intelligent decisions based on that data. So you need to bring in both those uh, tools, both those disciplines to really get the most out of the data. And then is it ChatGPT-like where... We have some natural language uh, processing tools that we have built to make it easy. In fact, one of the questions you know, in our survey product, Occam, um, uh, one of the pushbacks, one of the pinch points that we were seeing from our clients was, how do I ask the right question? Right. How do I? And you know, traditionally, you would hire a big consulting firm with you know, a good six, seven-figure contract to come and form the questionnaire for you. And then they'll go away for three months and come back with, the set of uh, questions that you need to ask, and then you go back and forth with them. But today, based on all the questions that our community has asked, we have come up with rules that form a good question. So when you just give it a prompt that I want to know about X, it will give you the five most important questions that you need to ask about the topic. Now you can go back and say, okay, maybe I want to tweak this question because of my experience on this on that, and you can do it, and you just hit a button and it just next day you start to get the data and, and actually insights, not data, insights, reliable insights on the topic that you care about. As opposed to, you know, the, so you've shortened the cycle, but more importantly, you made it much more unbiased. I would say that that, that doesn't... And, and cheaper. 
Uh, we don't sell on cheaper, but yes, it is a huge, huge cost differential. That's a good way of putting Sorry. it. It's okay. Maybe you're getting the friends and family discount uh, from Alpha Rock, right? Um, I, I would say it doesn't stop at surveys, right? That, exactly. That figuring out how to ask the right question 100%. is really, in a way, it's a differentiator in and of itself. You've got all of this data, but thinking of the framework and the way to actually pose that question is, is becoming increasingly important. You know, we've talked about machine learning, artificial intelligence, how they work together. Dan, can you can you you know give us some more insight on where where the two intersect, where machine learning and artificial intelligence intersects, and and use cases perhaps? I would say machine learning and artificial intelligence are. I I personally think there's a blurry line, but between those definitions, um, you know, at S and P we've we've got a bit of a head start with um, the AI challenge. We had made investments dating back to 2018 with our acquisition of Kensho Technologies, which is a leader in the AI machine learning space, as well as investments in our uh, divisional uh, data science teams, such as the quantum mental research team. And uh, the technology is, is very much at an inflection point. I think uh, we're starting to see some some interesting features develop with some of these more sophisticated models. So one of the things that uh, we find particularly interesting is that please and thank you matter. So we, uh, and I've got a hypothesis as to why this might be the case. Um, some of these large language models that are trained on these uh, really um, huge corpuses of data, uh, they've got access to responses um, that are in less professional settings and then responses that maybe um, generated from uh, an interview like this, where there are experts weighing in on um, topics that, that are of interest. And when you're uh, looking for a response that's uh, from a professional, the diction, the choice of words tends to be a little bit more professional in nature, a little bit more polite. And so, um, you know, it's an interesting feature of, of that model and, and that level of sophistication that Please and thank you really gets you through to the the uh, subset of the corpus you you want. Well, so many mothers would be so happy with uh, to to know that. But but that's actually a, that's actually a good point, and we've discussed this. Where, um, Vinit, for you, when in a more a more professional sounding piece of data, is that given a higher reliability score? Um. It's less about professional sounding uh, because we are more focused on the actual data, mm. but we do spend a lot of time trying to make sure that this data is reliable, it's consistent, it's, uh, you know, has meaningful inferences that can be drawn from it. So all those things, uh, our language models taken all those into account, especially when we look at Occam, for example, which is helping users formulate those questions, that tone is very, very important because the wrong tone can lead you to a completely different set of responses. Interesting. So, and that's why we trained all that on, on, on our own proprietary data set. Please and thank you matters. Absolutely. Hopefully, we'll become a much more civilized uh, place. What are you seeing, Dan, as kind of some of the biggest unsolved problems in data management? So, ownership continues to be a challenge. I think that as we start to get into more and more of these alternative data sets that are collected as as data exhaust from other businesses, there's a question as to who does that belong to? Is it belong to the end user? Does it belong to the company that's providing the service? Does it belong to a third party that may be collating all that data? Um, and and really, can it be transferred? You know, there's not a lot of. I would actually argue there's not enough um, regulatory guidance in in this space. And um, you know, I think I think that. Uh, Regulation can provide a lot of transparency to data providers. Second to ownership uh, is probably the concept of uh, just the the vast amount of content out there and figuring out how to distill that down into insights. But that is, um, you know, that is a solvable problem. It's just one that we're constantly refining and getting better at. Same question to you. We pay a lot of attention on data ownership. A lot of, in fact, one of the reasons why we started with uh, Occam as our first product was because we can own the data. There's no ambiguity about it. Mm -hmm. And if you can perfect surveys, for example, it alleviates the need to go 
and buy very expensive data and try to negotiate data management usage agreements. Because if you can just ask somebody what they think about X, Y, and Z, you can get much more better data, much more timely data, and much more cheaper data. Right. So that's why we built that and uh, put in a lot of resources. It took us about a year and a half to get the math and the predictive signals and the modeling right of, of uh, the product. But now it's been amazing because there's so many very technical. We put out a blog, for example, on roadblocks. Um, because Roadblocks is trying to up-level and go and become much more of an adult usage uh, game and an uh, ecosystem. But you can't ask kids how many hours they play. You cannot ask that. You can ask their parents. You can ask their parents. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly what we did. And we got a very detailed picture of how the, the game is being used, the software is being used, and who is using it. And f it was not uh, like uh, the adults are really jumping in with both feet. And I can give you multiple other examples uh, where the best thing, instead of trying to go, you know, jump through 20 hoops to get data, is just to ask if you can get a reliable answer. And that's why we have completely revolutionized that as the first place. And the other beauty of that is it predates the credit card data by three to six months. So if I can tell you today what's going to show up at the till, three to six months before what's showing up at the till, was not... There's huge value there. Exactly. Yeah, that's very interesting. We started our conversation, you know, talking about all the different types of data and the alternative data that's out there. And you made a, a great point that what's alternative to someone is standard data to someone else. And, and I could appreciate that. But in your, I'm gonna, I'll ask both of you this, you know, what have you pulled in or what have you seen or what have you been asked or what have you analyzed that was the most uh, unique Unique. Mm. Um, I'm glad you're taking it the first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so many, so much of what was probably, you know, maybe strange even 10 years ago has, has become standard now. So mm. uh, it's, it's a challenging question from that angle. I would say, you know, we have uh, content on weather that informs on everything from, you know, commodity prices to we've even shown uh, correlation of foot traffic at bank branches. Weather and bank branch data. Traffic. Right. Both of which we, we have in our ecosystem. We have uh, uh, some of the most granular bank branch data from our SNL brand. And uh, we have weather from a third party provider weather source with who's an S&P Global Partner. That's and interesting. We've got a nice, it's a, not my team, but we have a white paper, uh, S&P white paper that connects the two. <laughs> That's very interesting. What about you, Vineet? Uh I'd say going back to Occam, you know, by this community questions that are coming in every day help us make so much uh, make us all so much more smarter as well as give insights into what's on top of mind of people before apple came out with the vision pro headset a bunch of our clients had already asked what is the pricing curve that the market will take on this and it was nowhere close to 3000 so when this actually came out our clients all they had to do and look log in and see what the market was saying the market would bear for something like this. So these kinds of insights that our users keep generating and throwing out, I can't tell you how, how surprised we are at times when, when we hear, see things, questions being posed into the system. So every day we, Occam becomes smarter, but we become smarter as well seeing those questions that our community is posing. So it's not necessarily the data, but it's the questions that, are, that people are asking and what they're exactly. looking to pull in. Exactly. Somebody hears about, I mean, I'll give you another example, Walmart Plus. A client asked about Walmart Plus. We had never, I have never heard about it. None of my partners had ever heard about Walmart Plus, but that's the Walmart's equivalent to Amazon Prime. And we went and did the search and looked like 13% of Walmart clients are already subscribers, which if you think about the size and reach of Walmart, it's massive. It, it could be a game changer. And a couple of weeks later, Morgan Stanley upgraded the stock and then, you know, they were in the Barron's, uh, wrote a piece on it, and then everybody knew about it. But our community was, I'd say, good four weeks ahead of the curve, understanding, you know, just some somebody got that insight that, look, this could be big. He asked the question. We got the data right away in, within a couple of days, and somebody made a, a, a killing. And it's all publicly available. It's all, it's all it's I wouldn't say publicly because that would mean like it's on the web. But it's available to any subscriber uh, who's uh, subscribing to Occam. Understood. 
Well, thank you both. This has been a, a great conversation. And, um, and thank you, everyone, for listening to Beyond Alpha. Beyond Alpha.